gentlemen, once again, we're going to begin uh, the next session in just a minute or two. So we like to ask all of the participants to be seated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to begin a plenary session two, Creative Growth Models. Uh, this plenary is designed to sharpen understanding of the importance of creative growth models uh, for increased job creation, reduced poverty, and improved environmental sustainability. As such models are an inherent part of green growth. The need for policy reform and industrial progress in developing countries and how to further promote creative growth models are key issues that will guide us through discussion. And the moderator for the second plenary session is Dr. Tariq Banuri, the former director of the United Nations Division for Sustainable Development and currently professor at University of Utah. Uh, Dr. Banuri. Please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, and thank you to uh, Director General uh, Ivo Dibor and my dear friend Imran and uh, Dr. Lee, uh, M.K. Lee, and uh, other colleagues for inviting me. Congratulations to GGGI for this enormously successful and timely event. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, um, um, I have actually visited Korea several times. Uh, one of my first times was 1986, when I came to visit the Korea Development Institute. And the reason for that interest is that by that time, everybody knew the Korean miracle. Korea started from a very poor country, and by the mid-80s, it had transformed itself into an industrial powerhouse. It was an example that developing countries were looking to for uh, imitation, we were trying to draw the lessons from this uh, experience, and we really felt that, you know, Korea now has uh, charted out a new pathway. And it's very uh, important and very good that we are again at a crossroads. We are again at a crossroads, and once again, Korea is pro providing the example. Uh, on the last occasion, when Korea did this uh, industrialization process, uh, and we know other countries have followed, the main thing was that the industrial sector was the driver of growth. Um, <clears throat> we know that you know, over a 30-year period, if agriculture went up by a factor of three or four, industry went up by a factor of 40 or 50. That it is this massive increase because of the productivity growth of the industrial sector, because of backward and forward linkages, because there are no limits on growth, that the industrial sector could actually drive the process. Today, we know that the industrial sector, we know that the fossil fuel-based economy, all of these are under challenge because of climate change, because of the, uh, the threat to our environment, and we need a new pathway. For developing countries, the answer is very simple. For developing countries, they want to know, has somebody done this so that we can follow? When Korea did something, a number of countries followed, including uh, the, the dear neighbor uh, China has followed and tried to do the same thing. Somebody has to do this. Now, we are very excited also to see that Korea has now embarked upon a new model, a new model called the creative economy. What you can see, think about it as the following. The, the issue is that if you want to grow the pathway, there is a turnpike, there is a highway, and that highway, we understand how it works. It's a very fast rate of growth. Now, that highway is under stress, and somebody needs to come up with a new highway. For developing countries, it's very important for somebody to come up with a new highway. And we look to Korea as an example for this, and we want to know, is the creative economy the new highway? Is it something that developing countries can follow? So, there are obviously a lot of questions. Number one, the question is, is the creative economy something that is in Korea's interest? Will Korea we be able to have a high rate of growth through the creative economy? Will Korea be able to develop and maintain its well-being and prosperity through the creative economy? That's number one. 
The second question is, will the developing countries be able to follow this? Can they follow this example? Which means, what are the lessons? What are the experiences? What policies do you, do you use? Now, these are all the questions that we need to, we need to answer. Um, <clears throat> There's a third question also which I should mention, and uh, uh, Mrs. Mary Robinson is not here, but I think it's very important to remember the, the, the important lesson that she gave. She said, it's not only important to address these problems, but it is important to do it in a way in which the poor do not pay the cost. Can we actually do this in an inclusive manner? Can Korea do this in an inclusive manner, which would give help to the, countries, the other countries? Can other countries do this in an inclusive manner? So these are the, these are the questions that we, we, we confront today. And I was very impressed also by what Mrs. Robinson said. She quoted this, uh, this great poet, Seamus Haney, uh, Hope and History Rhyme. Um, it's one of my favorite poems. He says, history says don't hope. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, sometimes, the long-awaited uh, 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 tidal wave of justice can arise and hope and history rhyme. So, don't, history says, don't hope, but sometimes the long-awaited tidal wave of justice can arise and hope and history rhyme. And he says, so, <clears throat> believe in miracles. That's what Seamus Haney goes on to say. Believe in miracles, believe in cures, and cure, uh, cures and healing wells. And I thought that's also a good example because when we look at the creative economy, these are the things we are looking for. We are looking for miracles. What are the miracles we are looking for? That there will be political will. That developed countries will provide the money. That's a miracle. And, you know, right now we are a little bit more confident that it will happen. Number two, he says, believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. We are also looking for cures. Are there practical examples? Are there case studies? So we are looking for cures, and we, we, will, we will look to some of those. And then look for healing wells. Can we create the conditions in which we will have a healthy economy? What are the policies? What are the frameworks which we can use? Now, to answer these questions, or to answer these questions, we have an excellent panel sitting here. And my first task is to turn to our distinguished plenary speaker, J.K. Kim, who is the CEO of Siemens. And he brings together not only his knowledge of the information and technology industry, the knowledge industry, but experience in invention and innovation and experience in government and policy. And I think that is exactly the kind of combination that we mean. Mr. Kim, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Banuri, for your very kind introduction. Well, as we all know, there are three players in the market uh, pursuing the same goal of creative growth in the long term. But as we all know, their interests quite often conflicting with each other in the short term. Governments and international agencies like GGGI act as regulators as well as supporters of creative growth. In a globalizing world, international agencies and forums assume an increasingly more important role. Multilateral approaches are critical to address current and future environmental issues. Environmental issue by nature, a global issue. Therefore, I hope should be addressed at internet multilateral forum uh, in principle. However, we all know that delayed multilateral negotiations hardly meet our expectations due to conflicting interest among member countries. Therefore, multilateral initiatives should be supplemented by regional and bilateral efforts. APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, would be one of such regional forums to discuss issues on climate change. And you have been hearing from uh, uh, Beijing uh, last week. Uh, last week on November 12th, President Obama and President Xi of China made real progress on climate change. Two countries 
account for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the agreement between G2 will surely help facilitate multilateral negotiations scheduled in 2015. Business policies are affected by government policies and consumer preferences. A growing number of top-tier companies are pursuing sustainability management and make efforts to improve environment at their initiatives. Many studies show that environmentally friendly companies are more successful economically. The other way of causality also works in my view. Companies could address environmental issues much more effectively if they are successful economically and have resources to address environmental issues. By training, I'm an economist. I don't know which way of causality really works better. And consumers and NGOs are becoming more active. Although not well organized, growing consumer awareness has much influence on government policy making and business practices. The approaches to creative growth should differ from country to country depending on the growth stage and country-specific environment. In general, we see many examples of market failures in less developed developing countries. There are too little regulations to protect environment and too little resources to support growth. International agencies and developed countries should therefore support them in many ways. Monetary support is necessary, but is, this is not a sufficient condition. Helping build institutions in less developed world would be critical for systematic approach toward creative growth. Developing countries often introduce systems and rules developed by advanced countries and thereby face government failure. Too many regulations often result in incomplete in enforcement and too much financial support for business often result in uneconomical allocation of resources leading to government failure. Government support should be limited to remedy market failure, no more than that, and thereby be fully accepted by the people. From our experience, ex-post regulations tend to be more effective than pre-approvals, and incentive schemes tend to work more effectively than regulations. We often see the cases of government failures even in advanced industrial countries. For example, unilateral trade restrictions to protect declining domestic industry not only weaken international trade system, but also adversely affect its own creative growth. Technology and finance are the two key drivers of green growth. Developed countries should invest mainly in developing basic science and core technology in particular, and share resources and experience with less developed world. Helping develop underdeveloped world would be the way for sustainable growth of developed world in the long term. On the part of developing countries, one best way to drive creative growth would be to attract foreign direct investment to overcome the scarcity of financial and other resources. International agencies should play a pump-priming pump priming role and help build institutions for the less developed world. Now let me uh, give you one example of creative growth model in Korea's energy sector. Uh, Siemens conducted a small research on the Korean energy industry with a view to suggesting an eco-friendly, sustainable energy system in Korea. Uh, we disclosed the result of this research last year. 
uh, on the occasion of World Energy Congress, which uh, took place here in Korea uh, October last year. Korea consumes huge amount of imported oil and gas. As you know, Korea is mainly dependent on imported sources of energy. Korea's share of electricity supply from renewable sources is less than 2%, the lowest amongst all OECD member countries. CO2 intensity of power sector is 620 grams per kilowatt hour, which is even higher than that of the United States. The Korean government was committed to cutting CO2 emissions, aiming to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by the year 2020, as compared with the business as usual case. I'm afraid this goal seems not achievable. To secure energy supply, Yes, Korea has been making tremendous effort to increase efficiency and productivity of power industry and reduce power consumption. However, there remain many challenges. The goal to develop the extensive use of alternative energy technologies such as renewable is one key challenge. The tariff system does not reflect the true cost of generation, transmission, and distribution, thereby becoming a disincentive for private investment and efficient electricity consumption. The centralized control of the energy market could often lead to market disruptions. Here are some suggestions I would like to make, mainly based on the study Siemens conducted for the, uh, two years ago. Most of all, the electricity price should reflect the cost. Without this, all other policies would have very limited impact. Korea could privatize some of the energy sectors currently ma managed by the government. For this purpose, the Korean government needs to prepare a detailed program, including a clear timetable and milestone. Siemens' study suggests that coal to gas shift in power generation by 2030 would save 60 million tons of CO2 emissions annually from 2030 onward. And an increase in renewable by 20 gigawatt and nuclear power by 30 gigawatt in place of coal-fired would reduce 95 million tons of CO2 annually, CO2 annually from 2030 onwards. Korea should continue to promote eco-friendly economy as reflected in green growth and creative economy policies. Korea also needs to share its resources and experience with other less developed developing countries. As already stated by Professor Banuri, Koreans have something to share with less developed developing world. But I'm not saying that they should follow all the practices, policies pursued by Korea. Koreans have also made certain mistakes. And as I suggested here, they are trailing behind the privatization efforts, for example. Therefore, uh, if less developed developing world is going to learn from lessons earned by Koreans, of course, I'm not suggesting that uh, you follow all the experience uh, by Koreans. Well, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Siemens sustainability policy. Uh, from the perspective of Siemens, there are five mega trends shaping the future of our planet, including demographic change and climate change. Only one third of CEOs believe that business is making sufficient efforts to address global sustainability challenges. We have, you know, huge homework to do. 
according to this 1,000 respondents. And more than four-fifths of CEOs believe that government policy and regulation will be critical to progress. Siemens uh, continues to expand the environmental portfolio. Uh, in the case of year two, 2013, uh, Siemens have to reduce 377 million metric tons of CO2 emissions, which is about equivalent to about 1% worldwide CO2 emissions, as far as my memory serves, serves me correctly. And in pages 12 through 14, there are some examples of Siemens portfolio contributing to CO2 abatement. Renewable energy sources, uh, smart grid, energy storage, etc. And uh, this is uh, the case of uh, our building technology. Uh, portfolio contributing to uh, substantially reducing uh, CO2 emissions and the effective operation of buildings. As a result, uh, Siemens was ranked first for the past seven consecutive years in the industrial conglomerate category of Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Many people are asking us questions whether Siemens customers are willing to pay extra for this environmentally friendly product and solution provided by Siemens. My answer is not always. Because Siemens product solutions are more uh, environmentally friendly, customers are willing to, to pay more it's not happening all the time. And the next question is that whether Siemens will continue to invest in environmental portfolio in the situation where this investment is not fully paid off? Our answer is yes, for sure. We will continue to invest in this uh, environmental portfolio because it is one of our missions to make the planet a better place to live. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kim. You were uh, <clears throat> true to your billing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I think this is a very useful uh, introduction to the subject, uh, both in terms of the success of Korea, but also the recommendations that Mr. Kim has uh, uh, proposed. Um, we have uh, speakers now from, let's say, a number of developing countries, quote-unquote, uh, both high-income and low-income, but also international experts and Korean experts. Um, and so to reflect on this, I'm going to start with uh, my friend on my, on my left, uh, Dr. Thani al -Zayudi who is uh, the Director General of Climate and Energy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, those of you who know United Arab Emirates, uh, like Korea, has actually provided quite strong models for many other countries to, to, to imitate. Master City, City itself is one of the, the, the classic models, and I hope that he will bring some of those lessons for us. Uh, but more importantly, I think we want to know how to bring about this transition, how to move ahead with it. And I think we are looking to him for some of the lessons uh, from, from the United Arab Emirates. You have the floor, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tara. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I really would like to start by thanking the Global Green Growth Institution for organizing this event. It's really a good uh, opportunity for, for all of us to come here and share our uh, experience as well as uh, to share the best practices around the world and see how can we benefit from each other. Uh, for us, for the United Arab Emirates, the creative economy and uh, the nexus between the creative economy and green, uh, green, uh, uh, green growth is really well spotted by our leaders. Uh, we in the United Arab Emirates started uh, a while ago in the 
and the economy developments. But now we have reached the stage where we started talking about the creative economy and see how we are going to distinguish the country and looking into the future and sustainable our, sustainable our resources. Um, lately, a couple of months ago, the governments announced our, uh, our uh, uh, creative uh, policy and very soon we're going to announce our green growth strategy which we're uh, uh, dev uh, developed with our global partner the GGI and we really thank the uh, GGI for their efforts in developing the, 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 the strategy with us. For us the, uh, the UE uh, we have started working on that because of so many reasons and uh, we think that we have all the required blocks to really achieve our creative economy vision. Uh, we have very strong and visionary leader leaders. We have uh, very fairly young, diverse and motivated populations. We have uh, an environment which is uh, encouraging uh, business uh, and it's very stable investments uh, climate uh, and among us our ambitious development programs for our nation. A human capital. So we're, we have the, the right basis uh, to start moving toward the creative economy. L I will speak generally about the federal governments, then I will, I will dig into the master, uh, master uh, flagship project, which re really consider one of the really uh, creative, uh, creative uh, economy idea. The, our national agenda for 20, uh, 20, uh, 2021, and I'm sure many of you will ask why 2021, not 2020 or 2030. 2021 is our fifth, uh, 50th anniversary. So after, uh, by that year, we're going to, to be 50 years old. So you can see that our country is really still a young country. And we have, we have achieved so many things, and we're really looking forward to the upcoming seven years to really distinguish the country and to be one of the top five governments around the world. And having and honoring the creative economy concept and green growth uh, and gr uh, growth sustainable, uh, sustainable growth strategy is one of the things that we're building on and uh, uh, to achieve our uh, vision. Uh, the 21, uh, 2021 uh, agenda clearly set out our ambitious and uh, green growth strategy, which are pursuing the support of GGI uh, as seen as a major vehicle uh, to, uh, to enable it. Uh, we, uh, we have also set a target and KPIs uh, that w which we're going to achieve. And uh, we have done, uh, we have shared our vision toward a creative and green economy, but we are even keener to ensure things actually get done and we, w uh, we, we need to clearly measure things to make that happen. So we're not only launching uh, initiatives um, or launching strategy, but also we are assigning KPIs to ensure that we're implementing them within the time frame. Uh, at the same time, we're being a lot of focus on our human capital uh, how to bring the international investments, how to, to create the right environments for those international companies to come and invest in our, uh, our uh, nation. The national agenda and the green growth strategy has come with a clear set of KPIs, as uh, I just mentioned. Our green growth and national agenda KPIs cover everything, it covers all sectors. But we, we, we really uh, uh, focusing on the uh, couple of things, on the co competitiveness, uh, entrepreneurships, innovations, uh, and uh, dig into the details of the, the, the sectors, the clean energy, energy efficiency, and waste management, all of which are key growth engines which create interrelationships uh, that will be uh, received for success. Let, into, let, let me dig into the one of the uh, flagship, uh, uh, flagship initiatives that we have, the master, master uh, initiative. In uh, 2006, we launched the, the initiative, 2005-2006, and the question that has been raised to us by so many colleagues, why a UAE nation uh, which, is, which has a lot of oil and gas is really uh, keen on moving toward the sustainable uh, energy and clean energy and renewables, especially through MASTAR. And we have, to be honest, we, have, uh, we, we got so many resistance, especially from our region, because they thought that this is, this is a threat to our uh, natural resources. Our answer was always no, we're looking at the future, we know after certain years, we will consume the, the, the oil and gas that we're exporting uh, locally. So we, we would like to be ready for that period from now. And we, have, we came up with this master initiative from a holistic approach, uh, tackling the whole value chain whenever it comes to being a really a creative uh, uh, initiative. Uh, what, what do I mean by a holistic approach? We started with the human uh, capital. We, we, we established Master Institute, which is uh, the research-based master and PhD uh, uh, institution and very close collaboration with MIT to ensure that we have that 
uh, international standards and we have students not only from the UAE but also from the whole globe come and study and being our ambassadors around the world in this field. We invest in the research. We know that the clean energy and the renewable energy is very, uh, very concentrated in the Europeans and uh, on, the, on the American uh, market. And uh, uh, what we wanted, we would like to know from the uh, practices that they, they have done and see how can we tailor those technologies to our, our own environments. The, the UE is lying in the Middle East. The Middle East has very harsh and hot environments. We have very dusty and humid, humid weather. So is the, the first question that we asked ourselves uh, during that uh, in 2005, 2006, are the technologies of Euro the European technologies and American technologies can fit our environment or, or no? And the, the answer was basically no. We have to make sure that we were bringing those technologies and tailor it to our environments. And that's what we did in the first two, three years. So through, uh, by investing directly on, into the research. Al uh, are we going to do it alone? Al uh, no, we haven't decided to, to do it alone. So we have, we have the, the resources. However, we would like to bring the international investors and, uh, and invest with us to ensure that they're bringing the best practices, to ensure that they're communicating their, uh, their, their uh, best technologies to us. And that's why we created within, within the master uh, the, uh, the, uh, a zone, uh, we call a free zone, to ensure that those, those uh, international companies can freely work within, within the city. And, uh, we even expanded our, uh, our uh, uh, work to ensure that we're investing in infrastructure uh, projects locally and internationally. We have major projects locally and major projects in renewable energy internationally. And we're, we're working on, uh, on the uh, power projects within the city and outside. At the same time, we work with the local and federal governments in developing the, the right regulations because we want to replicate the idea. We don't want the, the, the master initiatives to be only constrained within the area of master city. We'd like to ensure that whatever we learned is replicated within the whole country, so we're moving the country toward achieving our 2020 vision uh, of being one of the top uh, international uh, governments. Now, nowadays, after almost eight years, we're really proud of what we, with what we achieved so far within master, uh, master City. We have so many students graduated master and PhDs uh, who are really very strong in the subject. We really did so many research, which has been even not only replicated within the, uh, within the country, but also replicated within the region and also in Africa, which has very similar uh, environment uh, uh, conditions. We also start developing the technologies and uh, even exporting the, the, the mines to those, uh, to those uh, countries. And we're working very closely in a very collabora uh, collaborative uh, manner. Projects, we're always open to invest, not only locally, but al also inter internationally. So whenever it comes to a creative uh, economy, we have this holistic approach to tackle all aspects to ensure the success of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, concept. I think uh, with that, I'll, I'm going to close my uh, uh, remarks, but uh, I'm sure uh, I'm looking forward in the future to really uh, present to you the outcomes from the, our federal uh, strategy, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you soon as well. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Devati. I'm sorry that I was trying to <laughs> harass you a little bit, <laughs> but it's, that's my job. I have to do it. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, I think already we can see some patterns in the, in the two presentations. I think the focus on projects, which are flagship projects, milestones, setting clear milestones about wind and solar and renewable, sharing experiences, both of them have been very, very keen on this. Um, I think the one point which uh, 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 UAE has done is the focus on human capital, which uh, was implicit in what Mr. Kim said, but uh, you know, there's, there's much more uh, explicit and also a holistic approach uh, to, to uh, uh, taking these plans. Uh, Mr. Kim also focused on pricing, which uh, is perhaps very important at Korea's stage of development, but we want to see what other countries' experiences are. Now, th there's this, this pattern, but I think now we want to reflect a little bit about bringing this together, and it is my great pleasure now uh, <coughs> to turn to um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Young Hai Choi, who is the Director General of the Creative Economy, and so he is really the person who is going to tell us what the creative economy is and what we can hope to achieve through that. Mr. Choi, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. I'm going to 
과정이 그렇게 길지 않아서 영어로 하는 것보다는 좀 심도 있는 논의를 위해서 그냥 한국어로 진행을 하겠습니다. 그 저희들이 이제 창조 경제라고 해서 준비한 게 지금 한 1년 반, 2년이 채안 됐는데 어, 작년에는 저희들이 창조 경제 개념에 대해서 많은 갈등과 어, 공격을 받았습니다만 지금은 저희 창조 경제가 이제 구체적인 실행 방안이나 인프라가 구축됨으로 인해서는 지금에 와서는 이제 창조 경제가 우리 경제를 돌파하는 하나의 큰 전략으로서는 자리를 잡은 것 같습니다. 어, 저희들이 생각하는 것은 이게 한국 경제의 지금의 어려운 상황을 장기적으로 풀어나갈 수 있는 어, 그리고 경제 성장 자체의 패러다임을 근본적으로 변화시킬 수 있는 것은 어, 창조 경제라는 고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 저희들이 여러 가지 정책을 다 추진을 해왔는데 에, 결국은 이제 에, 개인이나 기업이나 정부의 그 창, 창의적인 마인드셋 쪽에서 아이디어가 나오고 그를 통해서 이제 그 기업이나 새로운 시장이 개발됨으로 인해서 어 우리 결국은 우리 모두의 이제 그 일자리를 창출할 수 있는 그런 개념도를 가지고 있습니다. 특히 저희들이 금년도에 와서는 구체적으로 추진한 정책 중에 하나가 어 세계적으로 이미 글로벌리 진출해 있는 우리 한국의 대기업들을 활용하는 정책을 쓰고 있는데 지금 저희들이 17개 지역 단위의 창조경제 혁신센터를 구축을 하고 있습니다. 구축을 하고 있는데 거기에 이제 대기업을 자발적인 참여를 통해서 저희들이 대기업의 경영 노하우와 해외 팔로와 그리고 자금들을 활용해서 지역의 창조 경제성 또한 제고를 하려고 하고 있습니다. 어, 이 역이 그, 그렇게 함으로써 기업의 창의성이 이제 지역으로 퍼짐, 퍼짐으로 인해서 특히 이제 기업가 정신이 저희들은 되살아날 수 있다고 생각을 하고 있습니다. 또한 저희들이 보고 있는 것은 많은 정부 예산이 지역이나 전국적으로 투입은 되고 있으나 그 효과성에 있어서 어, 저희들이 걱정하고 있는 것을 해, 해결할 수 있는 것은 창조경제 혁신 센터를 통해서 회복과 어, 어, 융합을 통해서 해결할 수 있다고 생각됩니다. 그래서 지금 저희 이, 그 미래창조학뿐만 아니라 어, 산업부라든지 어, 교육부라든지 여러 부처에서 지금 투입되고 있는 자금을 저희들은 창조경제 혁신 센터를 통해서 이 센터가 직접 수행한다는 뜻은 아니고 각 센터를 연계하는 작업을 저희들이 지금 진행을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 좀더 효율적으로 저희 정부의 재정이 어좀 창의성을 발휘할 수 있는 쪽으로 어 투입될 수 있도록 노력을 하고 있습니다. 또한 저희들이 생각하는 창조경제는 음 과학과 ICT뿐만 아니고 컬그 문화와 예술 또한 다 포함을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 지금 녹색 성장에 대해서 얘기를 할 수, 하고 있지만 어, 저희들이 생각한 창조 경제는 또 다른 측면에서 어, 녹색 성장도 어, 다 포함해서 생각을 하고 있다는 말씀을 드립니다. 아까 UAE에서 2020년 그 KPI 계획을 말씀하셨는데 저희들도 13대 미래 성장 동력 같은 거는 어, 어, 저희들도 2020년도에 달성하는 계획입니다. 그 13대 미래 성장 동력에서는 어, 저희도 1, 1단계를 15, 16으로 잡고 있고 그 다음 2단계를 17, 18, 그 3단계를 20년까지 잡아서 저희들은 어, 세계에서 13대 미래 성장 동력 분야에 있어서는 어, 산업 생태계를 조성하려고 하고 있는 전략을 수립하고 있습니다. 또한 ICT 분야를 활용해서 산업 정책을 하고 있는데 여기서 보면 이제 녹색 성장과 관련해서는 이제 바로 연결되는 게 이제 스마트 그리드 정책이 있을 수가 있고요. 아, 또한 스마트 시티라든지 이런 분야는 어, 저희들이 바로 어, 저 에너지 절감과는 바로 연결된다고 하겠습니다. 또한 저희들 ICT는 저희들이 명칭을 어, 바이타민 A, C, F, E, H라고 해서 명칭을 붙였는데 바이타민 A는 agriculture, 바이타민 C는 culture라는 뜻이고 바이타민 F는 food, 어, 바이타민 E는 특히 environment라는 용어를 쓰고 있습니다. 
어쨌든 몸에 바이타민이 들어가면 좀더 활력차게 어, 움직일 수 있도록 하는 것 같이 저희들이 이제 장점을 가지고 있는 ICT를 활용해서 좀더 크리에이티브한 음, 프로젝트를 할수 있도록 하고 있습니다. 또한 그 중에서 음, 실증적인 데몬스트레이션이 필요한 부분, 분야에 있어서는 저희들이 내년도는 스마트 챌린지 프로젝트라고 명명을 해서 타겟하는 분야를 정해서 어, 저희 내년도에는 어, 실증을 할수 있도록 할 생각입니다. 또한 과학 분야에 저희 R&D의 예산이 어, GDP의 한 4점대 후반, 후반에 때 있는데 저희들이 이 많은 그 R&D 예산이 투입되고 있습니다만 많은 그 성과에 관련해서는 아직도 많은 의문이 제고되고 있기 때문에 지금 금년 말부터는 이제 R&D 분야에 있어서는 완전히 대, 대대적인 혁신을 적인 작업을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 금년 말까지는 저희들이 R&D 예산이 제대로 투입돼서 실질적으로 저희들이 특허나 기술을 제대로 확보할 수 있도록 하는 전략을 수립하고 있습니다. 그래서 저희 미래부 산업만 해도 25개, 20, 25개의 정부 산안 출연 연구소가 있습니다만은 이 연구소의 성과물이 그 투입되는 예산에 비해서 어, 사업 성과가 너무나 미미하기 때문에 저희도 전반적으로 이제 분석을 하고 있는 상황입니다. 그래서 금년 말까지 저희들이 R&D에 대한 어, 이노베이션 전략을 어, 확실히 해서 어, 내년, 내년, 내후년, 2020년까지는 어, 우리 국가 R&D 예산 투입에 비해서 성과가 어, 제대로 날수 있도록 지금을 어, 준비를 하고 있는 상황입니다. 어, 그리고 저희들은 이제 작년까지는 저희들이 그 창조경제 인프라 구축에 주목을 했는데 결국 창조경제라는 것이 모두에서 말씀드렸다시피 어, 경제성장 패러다임이기 때문에 아주 패러다임의 변화라는 것은 단기간에 이루어질 수 있는 건 아니고 어, 저희들이 조금 더 장기적인 시각에서 어, 봐주셨으면 하는데 그럼에도 불구하고 어, 어, 지금 대한민국의 상황 자체가 너무나 급박하기 때문에 어, 단기적인 성과에도 많은 주력을 하고 있음을 말씀드립니다. 또한 세계 각국에서도 이제 많은 이제 협력을 하고 있는데 저희들은 <웃음> 지난번에 그 미국 하고도 이제 창조경제 혁신센터를 중심으로 해서 미국에도 보니까 이제 대통령 산하에 기업가 정신 대사들이 한 10명 이상 있는데 원래 10월에 저희들이 만나서 어 상호 협력하는 모델도 만들고 있습니다. 그래서 아마 17개 기업가 정신 센터 아, 그 창조경제 혁신센터에도 어 미국의 기업가 정신 대사들이 와서 어 강연도 하고 서로 어, 전략을 모색할 수 있는 그런 장들을 마련하고 있음을 말씀드립니다. 일단 어, 저희 이 한국의 창조경제 모델이 아무튼 지금 상황이 좀 지나고 나면 제대로 된 결과물이 나오면 아마 많은 세계 국가들과도 협력을 해서 어, 좀더 글로벌한 모델이 나올 수 있지 않을까 그렇게 기대를 하고 있습니다. 감사합니다. 네. <웃음> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Choi. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to repeat that you know, we are getting some concrete lessons. Human resource development, setting milestones, both aggregate milestones and detailed milestones, projects, government investment, creation of some kind of an enabling field. Um, and I think we need to go uh, focus more and more about how much of this can be relevant for developing countries, how can they use this, what are the experience, how can they trust, and I think we, these are longer term questions, but at this moment we are very pleased to have with us Mr. <coughs> Jean Bosco Mugiraneta, uh, who is the CEO of the Rwanda Energy Corporation. Uh, he is basically in the hot seat right now, providing energy to people, but also to be able to do it cheaply, effectively, and hopefully sustainably. So what we would like to do is to turn to him and ask what are the experiences that he has, how can he share with us what are the successful experiences and perhaps even what do you hope to get from, to learn from Korea in terms of the, the, the future successes. Over to you, sir, Mr. Mugareneza. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the topic is around uh, creative growth uh, models. Uh, then here I think 
uh, about Africa, uh, especially in Rwanda, because most of the case uh, problems of Africa, they are solved out, outside of outside of Africa. So, uh, any creative model, uh, it has to consider uh, local realities, uh, local uh, needs, and uh, local resources. Because local realities that we have in Africa, they are different from local realities in in Middle East, uh, in America, in, in Europe. So the knowledge of local realities is very important to come up with a, a creative a growth or a, a solution. Problems in Rwanda or realities in Rwanda are different from realities in Nigeria, even if they are both uh, African countries. Local realities in Rwanda are different from local realities in, in Ethiopia, even if they are, they are neighbors. So consideration of local uh, realities, local uh, uh, needs and uh, existing resources, it is very important in a creative growth uh, model. Say in Africa, we have two potentials. We have uh, natural resources and uh, we have human resources. Those are two resources that we have. But the problem, as we have discussed this morning in, in, in innovative uh, technology, the problem we have is that we don't have uh, technology, but resources we have, uh, natural resources, we have uh, minerals, we have, uh, we have oil, we have uh, water, we have uh, solar, we, we have uh, wind, all those natural resources, we have them. And we have uh, human resources, but we lack technology. When you look at Africa, the north of Africa, it has access to electricity, which is closer to 100%. When you look at Tunisia, when you look at Egypt, when you look at Morocco, access to electricity is above 95%, almost 100 uh, It is almost the same in South Africa uh, as a country. But between South Africa and North Africa, in between, we are in darkness, and yet we have enough enough sorrow. So whoever will come to solve African problems or whoever will come to, to help Africa, he has to think of technology. Changing our problems into opportunities. But we have to change the way we see Africa before we used to see Africa as a continent of problems or as a continent of uh, conflicts. So many conflicts, so many problems. But it is high time to change the way we see uh, Africa. As I said, we have potential resources, natural resources, and we have uh, human resources. Uh, when you look at Western countries, uh, uh, even Japan and, uh, and China, the population is becoming older and older. But in Africa, 
the population is young. So I think that countries will come to Africa to get The microphone working? Go ahead, let's see. Uh, maybe it is because I said that we don't have technology. <laughs> uh, you see, when you take the case of uh, our country, Rwanda, 70% 70, 70 of our population is below 30 years. The, 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 population, the population is, is young. Uh, then when you, you look at in Europe or in America, people are because the population is, is, is old. So even if uh, in developed camp, uh, countries they have technology, but I think there is a time when they will need human resources from Africa. So I think we should start thinking of how we can equip uh, human resources in Africa with, with uh, uh, appropriate skills. It, it will happen in the future when developed countries will need human resources of, of Africa. So in Africa we have uh, natural resources. That is why now uh, uh, developed countries are competing with the China in Africa for natural resources. In the near future, they will also compete in terms of uh, human resources. So it is high time to create opportunities to change those uh, problems into opportunities. Currently, young population leave Africa, going to Europe, going to, to America. So what they want? They want opportunities. So let us have the same opportunities in Africa so people will not, will not move from, from Africa to other countries. When I was in America, a friend of mine gave me an apartment saying stay, stay here in America, don't go back to, to Africa, don't go back to, to Rwanda. I said no. I, I, I can't live in America working under table when I have my own country where I can live in my dignity. I said no, I have to go back home because America is not my country, I can't work under table. I, I hate it. I said I have to go back to go back home. So we have to change and we, ha we should have that hope in Africa that our problems can turn into uh, opportunities. So uh, human resources and the natural resources, we have potentials in Africa. What we lack is, uh, uh, is uh, technology. <coughs> so we, in, Af in Rwanda, for the last uh, five years, we have kept our economic growth at 8.5% uh, uh, because we have taken our our problems 
and we come up with uh, our own uh, solutions because of uh, consideration of those local realities, consideration of the natural resources that we have. We don't have too much natural resources, but we have the uh, human resources. We know our, our needs. So we have the ownership of our own problems. Having that ownership, we can turn our problems into uh, opportunities. And uh, we are targeting that in uh, 2007, our economic growth should be at 11.5%. And, uh, and we will. The other uh, thing we have to, to think of uh, in creative uh, growth is the law of political will. The political will should be there, the good governance should be there, the rule of law which brings that I I inclusiveness and uh, zero tolerance to, to, to corruption. Uh, corruption cannot allow creative growth. If you need any creative growth, you have to, to fight against, against corruption. All people, all citizens, they have to be given the same or equal or opportunities. And the, the population should be educated. It should be uh, involved in, in planning uh, so that the, 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 the overall is owned by the, the local, by the local population. Then, with the, our experience uh, after the, the genocide, like after the, gen, the genocide, we, we had so many people who committed the genocide, but we have used our own uh, traditional courts to solve uh, that, 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 that problem, and uh, it, it, it worked when, uh, 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 when modern courts it could have taken like a hundred uh, years. Local uh, uh, courts, they have been used, and we came up with a, a solution. When it comes to inclusion, uh, gender balance is, is our uh, uh, key strong area, because in our parliament, uh, uh, women, they they represent 65 percent. I think it is the highest in the world. In the cabinet, the uh, women uh, representation, it, re, it represents uh, 45 percent. Out of uh, five governors, uh, two are women. Out of, say, 30 mayors, for uh, uh, are women. We are still struggling with the uh, local government on the grassroots, but we, we will uh, succeed. So in Africa, what we need is uh, the infrastructure development. Then when we, there is a, a political will, when there is a good governance, when there are all those strategies which can uh, fight against the corruption, a creative growth uh, is, is, is possible. So our target in terms of access to electricity is 75% uh, within uh, three years. Currently we are at 22%. It is an ambitious target but we will be able, because the overall average of Africa is at 41%. Uh, but since it is a government target, we will come up with uh, access of 70% because it is the electricity which will change the way people live in rural areas. We have seen how mobile phones have changed the way people live uh, in Africa, now they are becoming cheaper and cheaper, and uh, 
they are penetrating uh, local markets, meaning that in rural areas we need solutions like uh, uh, solar, solar systems. Because now communication, mobile phones, they have reduced distances uh, that people used to, to, to make going from one place to another place. People, they can now transfer money without uh, going long distance. People, they can now buy and sell electricity using mobile phones. So I don't know which technology can work for Africa, but the example of mobile phones and solar systems can be an example. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, you can know that I've completely failed as a chair <laughs> because I was trying to smile at you. <laughs> but it was so uh, interesting and exciting that you know, I, I, I really could not afford to stop him. But the uh, two things I think which are really fundamental. One is I, I think this image that between North Africa and South Africa there is no electricity is an absolutely striking image. I mean, in fact, you can say that you know, half of all of sub-Saharan Africa's electricity is produced in South Africa. And, and North Africa is very well endowed, but in between, it's uh, uh, less than about half a kilowatt hour per person per day. That's kind of the endowment compared to 50, 60, or even more. And I think changing that is of the most utmost importance. And, and that, together with that comes human resource development, technology, and all of the things that creative energy uh, sort of puts. Now, with that background, it is my great pleasure to tell, turn to my very dear friend, Janusz Pastor, uh, <coughs> from the uh, World <laughs> Worldwide <laughs> Foundation for Nature. Uh, formerly, uh, we were colleagues in the United Nations when he was the advisor to the Secretary General on the Climate Change Support Team. Um, and he is a long-time sustainable development um, uh, environmental expert. And I think this idea of the creative economy and the green economy comes from this concern that we need to solve these problems, but we need to solve them in a way that doesn't exacerbate climate change, doesn't exacerbate biodiversity loss and so forth. And there's nobody better than Janusz to answer that. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Tariq, and uh, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back here in GGGI, see some old friends and hopefully some new ones. Uh, and I'd like to share with you basically four key points about how we look at uh, these issues of green growth, which is an important part of the creative economy. Before I do that, let me just say a few words about WWWF because uh, I think it will help to, to put my comments into context. Uh, our mission is uh, to have a world with people living in harmony with nature. And increasingly that went from a wildlife protection to a much broader sustainable development framework. And, and in that sense, we are very much into vitamin E, if I can use your, uh, your analogy here. But we also like vitamin GG for green growth. So you'll see that in a moment. We're a pretty large organization. We have over 6,000 people working in 130 countries. And we have 80 country offices, of which the latest happens to be in Korea, in the Republic of Korea. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleagues who are in the second row here, who are, provide the leadership of that office. Uh, we are really about solutions. Uh, that's our main role, is to try to find solutions. And we work with different partners with the private sector, with other civil society organizations, governments. It's about solutions so that we can make those choices, choices that President Yudoyono uh, addressed earlier today. Now, our vision of green economy or green growth is that there, is no, there are no miracles out there. there. We need to do a systemic shift addressing all, aspect, all aspects of the economy, production, consumption, governance, finance, distribution, and of course, for us, what's very important is the management of natural resources and the recognition of the value of nature. Uh, so, no silver bullet. We try to organize our thought in something we call the one planet living, and if anybody's interested, it's explained very nicely in our publication called uh, Living Planet Report, including in Korean, <laughs> uh, which we just pu published. It's all about preserving natural capital, producing better, consuming more wisely, 
redirecting finance, financial flows where they're needed, and of course, equitable resource governments. Those are the things that are important for us. Now let me turn to my four uh, key points. The first one is how can governments create a better enabling environment? And there are lots and lots of ideas here. But of course, starting with fiscal and macroeconomic policies to drive investment where it's needed. But if we do that and if you don't address the harmful subsidies, then we already have a bad start. And harmful subsidies, especially when it comes to fossil fuels, are key. Just last week I read an amazing report that even today we're uh, subsidizing the extraction, not all the other subsidies of fossil fuels, but fossil fuel extraction to the tune of $88 billion annually. Uh, is this what we really need to do? Um, re then. Um, Governments can also use regional and global trade agreements uh, to harmonize policies on green growth uh, and, and to facilitate the development and the dissemination of the technologies that we've already talked about uh, in this panel. Uh, for example, WWF uh, in the Mekong region, we work with five countries to bring together and work on, uh, re on regional energy policy so that we can be together. Uh, governments can also foster integrated policy interventions at various levels, from local to sub-regional and to regional. And of course, these have to be joined up. So it's not just the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Finance, but bringing together all the different ministries. For example, in Africa, WWF is working on an ecological future for Africa, together with the uh, African Development Bank. This is something that brings together all the different aspects of what you could call the green economy. Uh, also, we have to make sure that we finance, that we align the financing with the socio-economic goals that we already agreed to in other fora. For example, if the two degree C scenario is so precious to us, then we have to make sure that we align our, our policies. For example, the WWF has developed a finance toolkit for sustainable cities to be able to do this kind of alignment. Uh, for renewable energy financing and uh, resource efficiency financing. Uh, but uh, we also need specific policy interventions from governments, such as for sustainable consumption and production. Uh, we need to decouple uh, the resource use from economic growth. Again, WWF is quite active in different parts of the world. We have our Climate Solvers, Solvers Project, where we promote innovation with companies. Uh, we also have a market transformation initiative where we, our objective is nothing less than to transform the markets to reflect our mission. And of course, as very much already mentioned earlier today, uh, none of this will be possible if, if we don't do it in an equitable manner, including the gender equity issues. Uh, what is the role of industrial policy would be the second point. Uh, to start with, governments must have an industrial policy and they must have a green industrial policy. Often they don't have that, so let's start with having one. But it has to include all sectors. It has to make sure that there is a place for innovation and appropriate R&D. And of course, capacity, develop, capacity building and capacity development is so important. I was glad to hear in Mustar that you almost started with that. Uh, that is hugely important. And let's not forget the transboundary impacts, because there are countries, you, uh, you know, there are things that you can do, but the, the pollution, some of the impacts, they definitely go uh, beyond uh, borders. Now, uh, a number of colleagues er already this morning mentioned the massive urbanization issue that is coming up with the huge infrastructure requirements. We take this also very seriously and uh, uh, we have a, an activity called the Earth Our City Challenge. It's, a, it's again to innovate, to try to get cities to tackle their urban footprint. Um, some of the incentives, what is it that incentives that governments can put in place for the private sector to innovate? Uh, and uh, uh, there are just a few ideas here As for the shortage of time because we're close to the end. I don't want to get into the detail, but it's about partnerships a lot. I don't think we have talked about it enough. I was a place to see earlier today somebody spoke from CleanTech. WWF has a partnership with CleanTech uh, in the Global CleanTech Innovation Index. These are the different tools that can help people understand and also then uh, try to follow. Um, then uh, uh, also set rules for the private sector to internalize externalities. I saw in the slides, uh, I think it was Dr. Kim, about including the, the costs 
uh, of, of uh, externalities, and this is, uh, this is the way we have to do it. And uh, we have to, uh, uh, we work with many, many different organizations also to, to achieve that. And finally, uh, what can the international community do? And I will close with that. Uh, just a couple of points. I think financing uh, of a just transition to a greener development pathway is crucial. Uh, and just to get going sometimes required that extra bit of finance. Uh, the Green Climate Fund in this city is, of course, a very good example of how uh, that is needed. Uh, I think also the investment in science and research, uh, some of that needs to be done at the international level to understand better what these planetary boundaries are and what we can do about them, uh, understand better natural systems and how they interact and how they interact with the policy uh, world. I think that's something, and we have started a new institute in WWF, the Luke Hoffman Institute, that tries to connect uh, the conservation community better with the scientific community. And then, of course, the ultimate price here is that the big measurement issue is to go beyond GDP, because if we don't know how to measure progress, it's always going to be difficult. GDP is an excellent uh, indicator, but it's not enough for what we need. And uh, we're doing our contribution to try to make that also uh, happen. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Janusz. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give a big hand to our speakers, the plenary speaker, and all the panelists? Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to turn to you. Uh, please ask your questions. I think the important thing is we understand that Korea has embarked upon this path. We wish it good luck. We want to understand. We want to learn from it. But we are also mindful of the challenges faced by the Rwandas, by the United Arab Emirates, by all the other the developing countries of the world, and we want to make it relevant for them. So please ask your questions, and, and uh, let's have a, a, a good conversation. Do I see... Uh, a question or a comment, please feel free to make a, make a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Roman Garcia. I'm from uh, Yensei University. And uh, Mr. Janos, I was just curious with your closing remark regarding GDP. Um, what could you maybe introduce or maybe enlighten us with some other methods, I guess, regarding the welfare of nations besides using the GDP? Because GDP obviously just represents economic growth and we know for a certain degree that it is based on the welfare of how people are doing in the nation, but it really doesn't depict people. Like, because for example, Rwanda or like Peru, Brazil, like there's still people there that are struggling, though their GDP is growing really well. So I was curious to see if maybe if you can show us or maybe tell us other methods of how to go ahead and measure that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that question. Can we hold on to that, Yanush? Um, any, any other thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I can't see very well. Um, really? <laughs> uh, did they convince you? Uh, you're all convinced this is the right way to go? Is that the uh, solution? Um, Janusz, you want to take that question while we are okay. waiting for uh, well, while other colleagues are thinking? I, I think we can quickly solve the problem of the GDP issue. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no, it's, it's, it's actually um, it's a pretty complicated topic, but it's, it's pretty clear that, well, first of all, many people are working on this. Many institutions, uh, both scientific and policy institutions, are working on how to come up with a measure or measures that better describe uh, progress because GDP doesn't really measure progress, it measures something very clear, and we know what it is, but uh, you know, if, if something burns down and you have to build it up again, it's not necessarily progress, yet it can be positive in terms of GDP terms. Now, uh, some people are suggesting let's come up with a good alternative that will show everything environmental and social. I personally, I don't think that's possible. I think we have to uh, work on a different set of indices that collectively will better describe this. And, and there are interesting developments. For example, in the United Nations where I come from, you may be familiar with the Human Development Index, which is one of these where you add a certain number of factors into uh, something that other people are measure, and it actually measures that, it's human development. We are working on a number of indicators, either ourselves in WWF or with our partners, where we try to look at more uh, the footprint, the environmental footprint of our activities, or how 
the natural environment is, 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 is uh, behaving under pressure through the disappearance of, of species and things like that. Uh, global footprint, ec environmental, ecological footprint, living human, uh, sorry, and planet index. So there are, there are a combination of these that are possible. What we don't have yet is a globally accepted set of other indices that collectively describe. So we have still some work to do. <coughs> other questions? If not, I'm going to turn to Mr. Choi. Do you, do you have an indicator or set of indicators for the creative economy? You know, in the sense that, you know, how does it enhance human welfare? We are interested in human welfare. What, is, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you hope to achieve through it? Uh, <clears throat> 이런 데서 다양하게 나와 있고요. 그 다음에 창조 클래스라 그래서 그 캐나다 쪽에서 리처드 플로디어 교수가 제시한 크리에이티브 클래스에 관한 인덱스도 있긴 합니다. 그래서 저희들이 이제 사실은 창조 경제 전략을 추진함에 있어서 대한민국에 있어서도 크리에이티브 클래스를 얼마나 정도를 창출할 수 있느냐. 지금 현재 저희들이 생각하기에는 어, 그, 그 기간에서 어, 마틴 프로스페리티 인덱스 같은 쪽에서는 한 27% 정도를 어, 대한민국 창조 경제 클래스 어, 비율로 저기 제시를 하고 있는데 저희들은 그 지수가 좀더 이제 선진국 수준으로 어, 가는 전략을 한번 수립한 바도 있고요. 그 다음에 저희들 나름대로 어, 크리에이티브 이코노미 인덱스를 어, 저희들이 어, 지수를 개발을 했고 저희들이 한번 측정을 해본 바도 있습니다. 그러나 그 지수들이 민간 연구소 지수들과의 큰 차별이 없었고, 그 다음에 국제적인 기준을 데이터를 활용하기 때문에 데이터 자체가 한 3년 이전의 데이터를 활용하기 때문에 결국은 이제 지금 현 시점의 사항을 정확히 반영할 수는 없었다 하는 이제 반성을 하고 거기서 대신에 이제 지수에서 저희들이 떨어진 부분에 대해서는 저희들이 이제 정책 팔러시로서 다시 어, 반영을 해서 그 부분을 끌어올리는 전략을 수립하고 있습니다. 그래서 창조 지수를 살펴보면 저희 쪽에서 부족한 부분이 아무래도 어, 다이버스티 부분이고 저희들이 그 스타트업 중에서도 어, 글로벌리 저희들이 진출할 수 없는 부분도 보면 어, 주로 한국인만의 아이디어를 가지고 어, 이제 어, 기업을 만들거나 상품을 만드는 것들이 굉장히 한계가 있다 하는 생각을 가지고 있고 그런 측면에서 이제 인재 교육과 저희들이 다이버스티 측면에서 외국의 인력들과 같이 협력하는 쪽을 조금 더 치중을 해야 되겠다는 것이 저희들이 이제 국제적으로 본 지수 쪽에서 나온 생각입니다. 향후 저희들도 좀더 정교하게 대한민국 자체의 지수를 어 조금 더 검토를 하고 있는 상황이라고 말씀드리겠습니다. 네. 감사합니다. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I don't know, uh, sir, uh, whether we have answered your questions, but I think these are good starting points, and we may want to uh, proceed with them. I want to turn to you, J.K. What do you have to say <laughs> to Mr. Mugira Mugi, Mugi I mean, do we have the models which he can use? I mean, they want to supply electricity. They want to go from 22% to 70% in three years. Massive challenge. Should they do it with coal? Should they wait for renewable energy? If it's too expensive, people can't afford it. What, what should they do? Well, uh, talking about overall creative uh, growth uh, agenda in Rwanda, in my view, I think uh, the most effective way is to attract foreign direct investment. Whether that's going to be an energy issue, whether that's going to be an, another kind of uh, manufacturing issue, I hope uh, you would be able to attract uh, foreign direct investment. Well, in the very early stage of Korea's economic development, Korea has been mainly borrowing from abroad rather than attracting direct investment. And uh, later from uh, early 1980s, uh, Korea has become more uh, aggressive in attracting direct investment. And now I think foreign direct investment accounts for quite huge 
proportion of uh, Korean economy, particularly in terms of uh, R&D, for example, this constitutes uh, you know huge portion of uh, Korean uh, economy as of now. So, uh, so generally Absolutely. speaking, that is going to be the solution. And uh, well, I don't know whether uh, international agencies like uh, WWF or United Nations would be able to provide. assistance to uh, such countries like uh, Rwanda, particularly in helping them build institutions in the country. Providing financial subsidies, yes, that is going to be a good starting point, but more important in my view is to provide advices to help them build their own institutions, based on which they could move on. Uh, So I hope... uh, you know, uh, from Korea's experience, uh, that is going to be the most valuable contribution from uh, international organizations like WWF and the United Thank Nations. Thank you. Yeah. Now, can I also ask you, Mr. Uh, Alziyudi, uh, not only have you your own experiences, but you're also doing a lot of international cooperation. You know, you've set up the Master Corporation and so forth. Is there a potential for cooperation between you and Rwanda? And uh, do, you, do we have a, a possibility there? Can I, can I? Absolutely. A couple of things that I would like to highlight here whenever it comes to uh, developing a nation and achieving uh, targets. The human capital, and we're for sure we're willing to work with Rwanda and with any other countries and work on the human capital. Uh, institutional uh, uh, reform, as has been mentioned by uh, Mr. Uh, J.K., GGI is going, uh, should play a major role in playing on, on that, the institutional uh, reform as well as helping uh, helping them in shaping up the policy. And whenever it comes to electricity and renewables, we, we host in uh, UAE uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, which easily can develop their uh, renewable energy sector easily, which uh, the minute that they have the, regulation, the regulations and the policy, the investments not only from our region but also from the whole world is going to come there. The, the political willingness and political stability of the country is really a key issue. You can have very strong institutional as well as policy, but if there is no political stability, the investors are going to run away. And this is one of the things, the main reason behind the, the mid-Africa uh, being uh, living in the dark so uh, until now, that you know, the stability in this region is really not that, uh, that uh, effective. So the assurance for the investors is really high. But from our side, for sure, we're willing to work on human capital investments as well as the, the institutional reform within the country. Thank you very much. Mr. Mugir, I'm, I'm asking everybody to answer you. I actually want your advice on what we should tell these people. I mean, in other words, you have experiences in the real field, I mean, where there are difficulties. What do we have to tell them? And also. You know, what do you, what, what do you expect from them? I mean, how, 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 how can they actually do, contribute to the task, very difficult task that you have before you? Uh, uh, say, in terms, of, in terms of energy, what we do, we work with the independent power producers. Uh, the environment is uh, favorable. There are incentives, and uh, we have also a draft law which aims at reducing uh, uh, taxes. Uh, We sign power purchasing agreement with uh, independent uh, power producers, they say, for 25 years. So uh, any investor from any corner of the world is, is welcome, uh, but uh, we have also to think of uh, skills transfer, so we need, uh, uh, say, technical uh, assistance in terms of building, uh, capacity building for our people, for our uh, young engineers, so that in, in 10 years, in 20 years to come, we will be able to, to solve our uh, own problems uh, uh, technically. So that is what we want, uh, technical assistance in terms of capacity building and uh, 
uh, green planning, uh, green investment, and uh, green infrastructure. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have just started. There's lots of more questions and comments, but we don't have enough time, and the uh, organizers are on my case to close this session. Um, I wanted to give the last word to my friend Janusz, but I don't think we have the time for that. So with your indulgence, I will close the se session. Thank you very much for that one question, and thank you to our speakers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Panuri. Uh, actually, I think the session right after lunch is always the hardest, but uh, Dr. Panuri, I think you have uh, kept everyone awake and very much enlightened. So thank you very much for leading that very uh, interesting uh, discussion. And we also like to thank uh, the speakers for sharing their experiences. Uh, we're going to now have a short coffee break and then move on to the second round of panel discussions. Uh, let me see if I can get it right this time. So, uh, track A is about SMEs and micro enterprises. It will take place in Lotus One, which is here on the third floor. And track B is about public private corporation and it will take place in Lotus Five, which is also here on this floor. Uh, track C, knowledge sharing, will take place in ORCID 3 on the fourth floor. A coffee break uh, will be provided on the third floor and also the fourth floor. Thank you very much, and I will see you back here for the closing session. Thank you.